Scaffolding is what teachers do in a classroom to support students' learning. Scaffolding techniques include things like note-taking and reading buddies and manipulatives. They can include things that the teachers prepared ahead of time or things that are immediate responses to the fact that students are not understanding. You could, how else could you do it? Highlight it. All right, so if you highlight the different consequences, okay. and then you could make a chart? Okay. Right. okay, let me get some highlighters. The support that students receive from scaffolding helps them bridge the gap between what they already know and what they're learning. To examine scaffolding, we'll visit several teachers in the Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. A scaffold is meant to be a support for a student, to make the student feel confident that they understand what they're supposed to do and how to do it. And as the student grows more and more confident, the scaffold can be removed. To scaffold effectively, you need to know your students, where they are in their current understanding and where you want to take them. The teacher has to know which way a student learns best. It may mean knowing something about what the student's past history has been, what they felt most successful with. Tiffany James provides her third grade students with several different types of scaffolding based on how they learn best. Some of her students favor a kinesthetic approach. My class uses manipulatives for word study, and one of the types of manipulatives that they use are magnetic letters. First they write their word on the whiteboard, and then they build it, and then they mix it up and do it again. And they do it until they're comfortable knowing that they know the letters that go in the word, but that they also know the right order that they go in. All the students choose their own words, they're called their personal words. They take the words from their journal writing, words that they repeatedly get wrong, that are simple, like said, a word that they use over and over again, but they repeatedly get it wrong. They put that on their word study card, that everybody in the class has their own little card, and it's just a way for them to work on their personal words. And everybody has different words, and they know that, and they're, they're fine with that. For students who are visual learners, or who prefer to work independently, Tiffany uses a different scaffold. Another method that we use is the look, say, cover, write, check. And there are file folders cut into threes. And they take their personal words and they write the word once. They look at it and they say it. And they try to remember how to spell it. They cover it. They write it again. And then they check it. If they're right both times, then they're fine. They can go on to the next word. But if they've gotten it wrong either of the two times, they have to do it over again. Beautiful. For students who prefer auditory or interpersonal learning experiences, Tiffany James uses buddy checks. A lot like a spelling test, but they just have it one-on-one -on -one with a buddy, and they switch words, and they read them to each other, and then they switch the papers, and they check them. If your buddy gives you an X, then you have to try it again. Teachers can start to accumulate valuable information about their students from the start of the school year. Within the first few weeks of school, I have the children work in several different cooperative groups. I do a lot of observing, a lot of note-taking on the children. I also do some research on what the children have done in the past, and then I help work with them individually to find some of the tasks that they particularly need help with doing. As you get to know your students every year, you learn which children have difficulty with reading, you learn which children have difficulty sequencing instruction, you learn which ones think in a linear fashion and which ones are more global thinkers, and you try to tailor what you teach to their needs and offer choices that will match the way they learn best. As soon as you feel like you have a good set of notes, go ahead and get onto the computer. By having a repertoire of techniques, you can select appropriate scaffolds as students need them. We'll look at a few different scaffolding techniques. Taking notes is one of those study techniques that everyone thinks that they could improve upon. Teachers can help students with the understanding of what's most important by either providing a format for students to take notes or placing the notes into something like a visual organizer that will help students understand the key ideas and then where details are needed. Mesopotamia means, the word itself means, the land between two rivers. Ah, good, you're writing. Cities ended up growing up here along the river. 
Now, what do you need in order to have a city instead of a village? Nancy Kindem provides her students with a two-column note-taking aid. The right column contains notes on the lecture content, with blanks for the students to fill in during her lecture. In the left column, students generate questions prompted by the information in the right column. All of the students had the same blanks in the right-hand side of the notes, but the left-hand side, there were either fewer questions provided or more, according to what I thought they could handle. If I gave all the students the same thing, I would have some children just horribly bored waiting for, come on, let's move it with this. And if I gave them all nothing, I would have several kids that were totally out, out of the picture and not knowing what to do and likely to just quit on me. So if I have two or three different versions of the notes, then I can try to hit different ability levels in terms of their note-taking skills. Another scaffolding technique is manipulatives. When you're using manipulatives, it's just like it sounds. You're letting students put their hands on and figure things out in a concrete fashion, usually right in front of them. If you're going to be finding some square numbers, what are some tools that you can use? We start out the year learning the use of a lot of different manipulatives in math. So we might learn to use tiles, we might learn to use calculators, graph paper, all the different things that we will end up using a little bit later. We go through one at a time. All the children learn how to use each of the manipulatives. And then when we have different tasks to do, the children have a choice. If you're doing some smaller numbers, how about these? Some tiles? Ahead of time, usually I know which children are going to need which manipulatives, and there is a small group within the classroom that are going to need manipulatives to start with. Sometimes I just hand them to them automatically. Sometimes they come to me and say, do you mind if I use the tiles to figure this out or the graph paper to figure this out? And they have a choice of what they use. But some of the children who have a need for manipulatives really need that kinesthetic experience of putting together what amounts to puzzles or models in order to understand exactly what it is they're doing. I think it's often uh, reasonable for a teacher to give everybody the opportunity to try manipulatives in learning techniques and then withdraw them when the teacher sees that the student is having great success. Scaffolding is not simply a support for just your weaker learners, it's for all students because they're trying out something new. Providing reading materials on a topic that are at varied levels of difficulty is a way of supporting students who are struggling readers as well as meeting the more advanced readers' needs. You're going to look at some of Hammurabi's Code of Laws. First, you're going to read the laws. You're going to classify them by the type of consequence. Not all students are reading at the same grade level. So when I assign a reading, very often I will give some students material that's on the grade level, but then I'd like to provide something that's at a higher grade level for some students. Other times it might not be the level of the reading, but it might be the quantity. Today, it was a combination of both because the students that were on the Internet had all 200-plus laws that they had to skim through to find the ones they wanted to use for their categories, whereas the students with a written copy had a set of laws that I had chosen that I thought were readable for them, that were not the most difficult in terms of readability, and also there were fewer of them.